Well, I'm absolutely delighted now to be joined by Dr. Diane Pendry, and we're going to be talking about uh, immigration reform. First of all, welcome. Thank you. Thank you for taking the time to talk to us today. You're welcome. Now, now you presented a, a, a paper here at the conference. Tell us a little bit about your work. Yes, I, I presented a paper that's about the work that I've been doing with the Tennessee Immigrant and Refugee Rights Coalition. And I decided to, I've been working with the Tennessee Immigrant and Refugee Rights Coalition since 2005. And so we've been involved in a whole series of activities to obtain immigration reform, uh, you know, uh, immigrant rights, etc. And uh, we now in Knoxville have uh, a, a Comité Popular, which is an immigrant-led group, and then we have an allies group that supports them. I, I, I actually serve as the liaison to the Comité because I speak fluent Spanish. Um, and so we've organized a whole series of activities because in Knox County we found out that um, even though uh, the federal program 287G has been uh, discredited at a national level, in 2012 they announced that two new counties were going to have uh, 287G and it turned out that it was Knox County, Tennessee was one of those two counties. So we launched on almost a year long, over a year long campaign to try and convince our sheriff not to sign this agreement. This agreement would basically deputize county officials as ICE agents. And uh, we don't think that that's a good idea for local law enforcement because basically that means you have immigrants who are too afraid to uh, report crimes to the police. Are you finding that it's uh, tougher in Tennessee now for uh, immigrants than it maybe used to be? Uh, well, one of the reasons it's tougher, but it's not just in Tennessee, is the idea that actually um, Turk was founded in 2001 precisely because they had a campaign to achieve the driver's license, enable people who could not present a valid social security card to actually obtain a driver's license. And then hopefully federal immigration reform would eventually offer people a way to regularize their status. So what ended up happening was in Tennessee, that passed in 2001, that was right before 9-11. After 9-11, there was pressure to sort of uh, withdraw it, plus we have some conservative uh, state legislators, and they decided to first reduce it to a driver's certificate, then to uh, get rid of it completely. So by 2008, uh, we don't have a very well-developed public transportation system, and besides lots of immigrants work in, in professions like construction, landscaping, you have to drive to the job. It's what's happened in terms of enforcement basically since 2006, 2007, and it's not just in Tennessee, is the idea that people are getting picked up for a minor traffic violation. Uh, they can't present a driver's license, so they get taken down to the police. Uh, it wasn't until I interpreted for some people that I even realized, I thought that was a traffic violation. No, it's a misdemeanor uh, to drive without a license. So that at the point of arrest you can actually get put into deportation proceedings so the numbers of deportations have escalated it's like a thousand one hundred per day so a lot of the immigrant rights groups around the country have been uh, they, there's basically a two-pronged campaign one is to try and get federal immigration reform the other one is to try and stop deportations or have campaigns to stop individual deportations. okay so let's talk a little bit about uh, federal immigration uh, reform it seems to be a very stop-start process on the one hand you have uh, uh, groups of senators and, uh, and representatives saying that this is important this needs to get done on the other hand doesn't seem to be much evidence of it getting done. That's right. and I, I would say the immigrant rights groups are pretty concerned about the idea that, okay, so the Senate has passed something. What the Senate has passed is not a great bill, actually. Uh, there are, I mean, they have like a 13, they, they do have a pathway to citizenship. That part is good. It's a, a path with a lot of obstacles. And one of those obstacles is if you can't show, if the, if the family can't show that they're earning 125% above the poverty level, they're not going to be eligible to become a lawful permanent resident. Uh, you know, uh, the, the problems with the policies now is that they're not, they haven't been allocating enough slots for lawful migration to people who are working in low wage, low income types of jobs. I mean, that's, that in a nutshell has been the problem all along. And so they're still putting roadblocks for people who are poor. That's basically how important, what's happening. My final question would be, how important is it to sort this out? Well, for the people who have to live under this, it's kind of awful. So, yeah, it, it would be important to try to 
get some way to allow people to regularize their status. You have a lot of, you have 11 million people who are undocumented, you have uh, people who are living in mixed status households, um, small children who, you know, they have to worry whether their parents are going to get carted off the next day or whatever. So, um, yeah, we do, we do feel it's important. And I also feel it's important, one of the reasons I got involved with this is I'm concerned about the anti-immigrant language uh, that, that people in the society are using. Um, I don't think it's good for our society. I'm alarmed by the hateful language that now all of a sudden this category, quote unquote illegals, um, that they're, you know, it's okay that to, to like trash them. It's okay to, I mean, there's some very dehumanizing language. That, to me, that's alarming. Okay. Well, thank you very much indeed for talking to us today. We appreciate you taking the time. Thank all you. All right, thanks.